Welcome to TOT, the podcast. Before diving into today's episode, I have an important reminder slash disclaimer to share. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on this podcast are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. Content provided on this podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and should not be taken as professional advice. We encourage you to do your own research and consult with qualified professionals before making any decisions based on the information discussed in this or any other episode. Additionally, any opinions or statements made during the podcast are not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, or individual. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the show. I like to be away in my patient. Stay up, I feel so outdated. How can we look the other way? Sun is out, but the sky is gray. What would happen if I took When you get new leadership, everything has to change. Uh, so and I don't think that's necessarily bad. I think after having one superintendent for over 10 years, it's maybe time to think about like, are the goals that we had still the same goals that we need? And let's revisit that, right? Um, but we did that. And in that process, I think they came up with, I'm I'm not going to get this number exactly right, but I'm going to be in the ballpark. It was like 37 different initiatives that we're working on as a district. That's not ever going to be feasible for anyone. I don't care who you are. A few years ago, I started writing a fictitious story based on my time as an educator. It is called Taught, and the story was partially inspired out of anger and frustration fueled by burnout. Okay. Actually, it was more than partially inspired by anger and frustration. But Tot has also become a vehicle for me to tell what I thought at the time, and in some ways continue to think, was and is the real story of teaching. I now realize that my perspective is not everyone's perspective, but there are some pieces of Tot that resonated with many educators. This podcast is an extension of that story, and I, a former teacher, will interview other educators asking them to share how they really feel about the current state of education. Why are so many teachers burn out? Why are so many, like me, leaving the field? We likely won't solve any problems or come up with any solutions, but we can create a community of voices that maybe begin the conversation around how educators can take back teaching. I'm Melissa LaFour. Welcome to Taught, the podcast. Today is part two of a two-part episode. If you didn't hear part one, no worries. Go back to buzzsprout.com and click on last week's episode. I always go back to thinking about like what works for kids, right? What works for kids is if we can figure out what they need, put a system in place to support them monitor that data to make sure it's working. And if it's not change it, but like not a complete 180, right? Like make an adjustment and keep working towards a goal. And then in our own system, we are like, okay, teachers, here's 10,000 things to do. And we're going to give you a bunch of deadlines, but we're not going to really give you a map as to how to do any of it. Go. Yeah. I, of course, I'm going to agree with that. How could you not? Um, If you're in any portion of the system. That's exactly how it is. And it doesn't matter if it's administrators. I always use this example, even down to our custodial staff and our office staff, everyone has more than what they know how to do with. And a lot of it is systemic and a lot of it is changing the systems. So we get everything done and then we have to make some transition to something and everything gets turned upside down. And actually it's hard to see a lot of the hard work that you've done just get shoved to the side. That goes mm-hmm. back to that leading to this idea of what we're doing doesn't have value. If it's hard for me to see the value, because I keep having to throw it in the dumpster <laughs> and do something new, I mean, it's really going to be hard for me to 
impress upon the kids that what we're doing has value? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? How do we, what can we do? Um, I, I don't think that there's a magic answer, but I do think that there are so many ways for us to be more efficient and effective than we currently have in place. Right. And, and a huge thing, um, is deciding what is most important and letting go of some of the rest. I, I don't, I hear this is true everywhere, but I can't speak to other people's experiences, but um, initiative overload. Um, I'm I'm trying to remember, they actually just did a count, like we got a new superintendent and so then we got a new strategic plan and then, you know, we did all of the things because when you get new leadership, everything has to change. Uh, So, and I don't think that's necessarily bad. I think after having one superintendent for over 10 years, it's maybe time to think about like, are the goals that we had still the same goals that we need? And let's revisit that, right? Um, but we did that. And in that process, I think they came up with, I'm I'm not going to get this number exactly right, but I'm going to be in the ballpark. It was like 37 different initiatives that we're working on as a district. That's not ever going to be feasible for anyone. I don't care who you are. Um, that might be a little overshot on the number, but it was it was ridiculous. Like this can't be what we're doing. And we are so focused on doing every single thing that we do them all bad. Yeah, because we can't put the time or effort into any one of them. Um, one of the the systems that I am a huge proponent of, and some people will say this is a terrible thing to support in education, and I can argue with you all day as to why that's not the case. <laughs> um but I, I think the the big name is MTSS, right? Like multi-tiered systems of support. But I think about it often in the land of behavior because that's where I spend a lot of my time and energy thinking. And the one that we've done in education, at least since the early 2000s, is um, PBIS. So Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. And what I'm noticing, at least where I exist in education is that we're not doing it well. And I have been, I mean, you're like, yeah, not surprised, right? Um, I am doing a really, like every month we pull people who are social emotional learning and PBIS leads from, from buildings to do some training with them, which is incredible, right? So again, our system is valuing this enough to say like, this is important work and we're going to train these people to take it back to their buildings um, but without a clear system in place as to how to do that, which we're working on. Um, but I was like, hey, how many of you in our system, we've been doing PBIS for over 15 years. How many of you who are the lead people in your building on this, how many of you were trained 15 years ago? Um, two of, of 27, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, And since then, because many of you are newer than that, how many of you have been trained and could say like, yes, I know what I need to know about how to implement this system that as a district, we have a policy and procedure around and say we're doing? Two more. Yep. And those are the people who are dedicated to doing the work. So that's probably, you know, most of the people in the building who are in, in each building who who know what this is and how to do it and how to do it well. So we don't know how to do it, but we say we're doing it. And then we say it doesn't work. You're absolutely right. And I think that there, you could, you could create a sentence stem. It would be a long one based on what you said, but you could put a lot of different programs in there and say that the yep. same thing happened because mm-hmm. what we do, and I have done this myself, I'm not, lay and blame anywhere except for the fact that we don't have time to do it all. That's where the blame lies. But there have been many times that I just learn what I have to know and what I have to do. I honestly mm-hmm. as a teacher, I looked at it as what's the bottom line? Yep. What are the things that I absolutely have to do? What are the what's the language I absolutely have to use? 
And the rest Mm -hmm. of it, I did not even spend time with. Right, because you don't have time. Yeah. Or capacity. Especially when it's forever changing, as we already talked Mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Right, which is why I go back to we can't do... 27 or 32 things we can do three yeah if that maybe one well and one at a time right and then you cycle through them and keep coming back and coming back and coming back but we can't if we're doing all of those initiatives and again we have to prioritize what really matters what's going to not only and, and I say this because I know that there's no getting away from this, like not only what is going to increase student test scores, which I, I loathe to say, um, but what is actually going to make students and adults want to be at school, have a positive experience, because when that's happening, more learning will occur. Do you think that there are... Are there areas around this that we should be more concerned about? So uh, my question is, we have all these students, are they all being affected equally by what we're talking about here? And of course, this is a loaded question because I know what you think. I just want to hear you say it. Uh, Yep. So I have a few thoughts on that. And we also, as districts, as states and as a whole country have data to prove that there is huge disproportionality and like top top areas students we don't serve well and and i'm thinking specifically of disciplinary data so students who are most often excluded from the educational environment right so they're in school suspended out of school suspended just kicked out of the classroom those are the big ones, right? Because if you're not at school, how do you learn? Right. So I I start with that. And the students who are most impacted by that are are Black students. First and foremost, um, students who have IEPs and um, oftentimes language learners. Yeah. So our students who need us, right? Yeah. To to have these opportunities to learn, we're like, well, you're too difficult for me, so you can just leave now. So coming full circle, we've got burnout teachers from too many demands who don't know how to get their own needs met, showing mm-hmm. up into classrooms, not being able to meet the needs of the students because they are not in a place where they can meet their own. And when we try to put these initiatives in, we say, okay, we d- we can't do that. And so we continue cycles where the same groups of students are not making progress or getting their learning needs met. Mm -hmm. That's enough to just make you want to run for president. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) Me neither. Okay. I just thought I'd throw it out there. You never know. Okay. Well, um, so I, I I said when I started this podcast, I'm like, oh, we need to talk about solutions. But these are big things. And I think that they can't be solved by two people mm-hmm. um, or even one group. So I'm going to have to do some more thinking on this and more conversation, I think. Mm-hmm. But I'm really excited to hear that you're doing the position that you're doing um, because it's unusual to have in a school district and to Mm -hmm. see that there has been enough noise out there that your district thought that it was important. You know, interestingly, the department came to be right before social emotional learning became a politicized issue. So we we made it in just in time. And now uh, we are contested. It is believed that we should not exist. We actually did in our department, 
trying to think about like, how do we do this work and how do we do it well, right? Because this is really foundational work to support adults and students in our system. And we're like, we are like, I identify as a white person. Many of the people I work with also do. And we're like, we are, you know, middle-class white people. And that doesn't necessarily match all of the demographics of the the people in our system, like students that we serve. So like, let's ask them, what do they need? And um, overwhelmingly from educators, family and community members and students, we were told they need social emotional learning. They want it. They want to do it in a way where students feel empowered. Families want that for their students. And then there's this small vocal group of people who are like, how dare you indoctrinate my children? Yeah. Social emotional learning should only happen for kids who need it. And should and outside of school hours and everything else should happen with families and not at school. Yeah, I, I I'm glad that you brought that up because there are so many of these things that we see that are generational, right? So mm-hmm. we have a generation of people who teach their children whatever their values are. And then that generation of children does something very similar. So for the portions that have those needs being met, that philosophy is fine. But Mm -hmm. to assume that everybody has that same experience is really, really frustrating. Yes. Because over the years, I've definitely had my share of parents send me, you know, those emails that are like, why are you doing this? Why would you be talking about this? Don't you need to be teaching reading and writing and math? And yes, I do, but not everybody comes from the same socioeconomic background and not all of us come from the same home life. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, my backstory, because of my backstory, I present as a middle-class white person who does all of the things that middle-class white people do. But my growing up was very, very different from that. And I see those students. And if we don't have some interventions in there, where are they going to get it? Their parents don't have the skills. And it's not just parents, right? Their communities that they're coming from do not have those skills that they need to take care of themselves in a lot of different capacities. And again, I'll just use myself as an example. That way I'm not offensive to anyone. But my mother was a pretty major drug addict. And I was raising myself and my brother and sister at the time during my formative elementary years and up into middle school and high school. And I had people from other areas come to me and say, hey, you know what? First of all, you're cussing like a sailor. Not appropriate. People do not want to approach you when you're doing that. They are afraid of you. They they don't think that you're polite here's something you might try instead. Never occurred to me that you shouldn't use those words because no Mm -hmm. one had ever talked to me about it at home. Did that make my home life, everybody there horrible? No. And that's a very small example. But you know what? If you go into any work environment and you're using foul language, you're not going to get the respect and the promotions and whatever else you're hoping to get out of that environment. But again, using myself as an example, I can tell you right now, it would have never occurred to me not to use that language if I hadn't had some very kind, well-meaning people who said, you have a lot of great ideas, but you have a really foul way of getting them out of your mouth. (laughs) So um, might think about doing this a little bit differently, you know, and it was super helpful to me. And that was actually, I dated a guy, his parents. His parents were like, woo. (laughs) You know, they didn't say stop dating this girl. She's trash. They said, "Mm, we see potential in you. Here's something you might change. Right. And and I think that that's what you just said. There's the whole idea, right? In social emotional learning, 
how do we help or support students to develop the potential within them? And that looks different for everyone. And I, I don't think that it's because some kids need it and some kids don't. I don't think there's a person on this planet who doesn't benefit from being thoughtful about who they are, how they show up in the world for themselves and in relationship to other people. Absolutely. That's all social emotional learning is talking about. It's how do you manage yourself and how do you manage your relationships? And if you think we can be in school and not talk about that or deal with that, we're going to do it one way or another. We're either going to punish kids and tell them they're bad, or we're going to teach them and say, here are some other ways of doing this that might help you find more success in your life. And kids who need that fall across the spectrum of what their family dynamic looks like or where they've come from. Yep. And you're leading me right into our three for the road. So here's your magic wand. What is one thing you would change? You only get one though. Immediately in education, if you could. I think the one thing that needs to change, I'm, I'm going to, it's, it's two ish, but it's one, <laughs> right? So we need to really just start trusting teachers to make decisions, but we can't just put trust in teachers who have been working in a broken system. Because That's we're really doing it in point. a broken way, right? Like yeah. we have to put trust in teachers while providing them with all of the resources and supports that they need, which can't be ever changing. Yeah. Um, I cannot tell you the amount of educators I talk to who don't feel valued, who don't feel respected, who feel overwhelmed. That needs to change. That is the thing that needs to change. Teachers want to, I teachers need to want to be here. Yeah. And the attitude around that needs to change, but it's not just an attitude because if we could just say, like, like, I feel like we keep shifting back to early COVID times, but do you remember when people were like, teachers are amazing? We respect yeah. and value teachers so much. And then it quickly turned into, I can't believe these teachers are still getting paid when my kid is sitting at home learning. Right. And I don't think, again, I don't think we've recovered from that as a whole. I think there's still a lot of questioning what teachers do and what their value is. And we show that value in a lot of ways. And one is by not having any sort of clear direction as a system. And I mean, like across our country as to what education looks like, we don't, pay teachers enough for the most part to do the work that they do. And I mean, I could, I could go on and on and on, but well, um, you touched on something though, and there's a name for this and I should know it because I just listened to a podcast about it, but I don't remember the name of it, but it is this um, phenomenon that happens actually, to be honest with most of us around something at some point, but it's where you think you can do something just because you know a little bit about someone else doing it, or you see them do it. Do you know it's what I'm talking Dunning about? the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yeah. Oh, say it again. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect? Yeah. I, yeah. Sure. Uh, I was, I was in a, I was at a conference all of last week and that was mentioned in one of the sessions I was in. And it's exactly that, right? Like we know just, just enough to think we know everything. And then once we actually learn more, we realize we don't know anything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that this has, teachers have definitely been victimized by this uh -huh. <laughs> because I think that everybody thinks that you can get a expo marker and a whiteboard and a math book and voila, you're a teacher. They don't see what goes on behind it. And I want to say that I've been a victim of this many times. It's usually around sporting activities. Um, most currently, it's around my Pilates stuff. I see the other girls doing stuff. I get up there and do it. Whew. Respect. Respect to those girls. And I think that that could potentially happen 
for people who really took the time to see what we do, um, educators. And I'm not just talking about teachers at this point either. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about, like I said earlier, the office staff, the custodial yep. staff, the school nurses, librarians, the tech people, the administrators, all yes. of us, paraeducators. We have each of us, huge responsibilities in our area, as well as expertise. And I'm going to say that most of us have some sort of natural talent for what we're doing as well. And those mm -hmm. things do not get respected at all. It is exactly what you said. Post-pandemic teachers are great. As long as you're risking your lives, yeah, you should yeah. be out there risking your life. Yeah, front lines. Go out there, teachers, finally doing something. You know, yeah, we're all about it. So is that what it takes? One of us, and I'm not going to go on a tangent here. I'm probably going to have to cut this out because I am all riled up now. But the other <laughs> thing is, uh, do I have to take a bullet for you to respect me? A punch to the face? Is that, I mean, because I feel like that's where we're headed. I, I feel like we're to. already there, right? Yeah. Like that's happening all too often. I mean, the the group of paraeducators I worked with, that was that was their complaint, right? They were like, we are getting hit, kicked, punched every day. And and they're like, and it's not that our admin team isn't coming in and doing this work with us. Like they are on what they called the front lines with them, but there's no system in place to change it or make it better. We can't keep doing this. It's got to be better. And um, you're right, we should not talk about taking bullets for students, but, um, you know, we we cannot be trusted as educators to decide which books students read or which curriculum we teach. But in Tennessee now, we should be trusted to have guns in our classrooms. So that's a wild new situation that I want no part of. Um, that's not that new. So, I, you no. know, I put I put that in my book. And I wrote that yeah. years ago, <laughs> yep. but the situation I was talking about happened in 2012, where I sat at an in-service and that was the discussion and it's happening in Texas as well. Um, to, to shift us back. Thank you. Uh, I, I need that. <laughs> I, I Well, that idea of teachers just not having respect. The amount of times I've heard people say like, oh, when I retire, I think I'll go teach. And I'm like, do you have any idea what you'd be getting yourself into? That is not a retirement job. It yeah. is a really hard career choice. And I don't, like you obviously don't know what teachers do if you think that that's what you want to do to relax in your retirement. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nothing relaxing about it, for sure. I mean, in Washington state, we just passed legislation, what well, was like in 2019 or 2020, around the need to educate educators on the impact of secondary trauma. Mm -hmm. So yeah. your retirement career is going to be one where you experience secondary trauma? Like, wait, what? I, I, don't, I don't think you know. So... so Right back to that Dunning Kruger effect. <laughs> on my on my website for this podcast, every week I make sure that I post. Um, I have a friend who is a grief and trauma therapist. Her name is Melissa. She does online work, and she is available. Should anyone need that? Um, and I have another friend who's in Colorado, Amy Shamberg. She also is doing work around specific, Amy's work is specifically around educators and processing whatever they need to process, as well as setting up systems of future self-care. Um, I would also plug a book that I share often with educators. And, and I just, I say this because I found it super supportive and I know many others who have, but um now I'm going to blank on the name of it. It's Laura Vandernoot Lipsky. She wrote, I will think of the name of it as soon as we're done talking today. Um, but she's got a really good book on burnout and 
um, secondary trauma and vicarious trauma. She's also got a really good TED talk, which if you don't want to read the whole book, I would just watch her TED talk because it's phenomenal and helps you understand how skewed your perception becomes when you spend a lot of time around people who have experienced trauma and in education, that is um, a lot. Some some stats that I often share. In 2019, the CDC said that at least one third of students were coming with at least one adverse childhood experience, which we know to potentially cause trauma. And that is only using the oldest data on trauma for students. Now we look at it in a much more broad way. And I really like that one of the potential causes of trauma is um, like natural events like hurricanes or earthquakes or things like that, but also pandemics. So now our likelihood of experiencing students who have experienced trauma is, you know, 100 percent. Yeah, (laughs) you're not going to have one that hasn't. Right. Everybody has. And we all need to figure out how we as adults can stay regulated to be around kids who are going to become dysregulated and need our help. So send me the link to the TED Talk and the book, and I'll put it in today's show notes for your episode. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So let's uh, let's lighten it up. Okay. See, we get to talking about... Uh, well, we're not going to lighten it up, actually, because <laughs> <laughs> since we're talking about trauma, um, because of the nature of what we do, we do witness trauma, we absorb it, we see tragedies. To your comfort level, talk about one of the things that has had the biggest impact on you. So. It's interesting because I was thinking about this question and there are so many things to process, so many things that come up. And I think an easy thing would be to think about things that have like personally happened to me and that that stuff doesn't feel as hard as watching what is happening. And and it feels like the most traumatic thing to me is, is those little moments that add up over time. Um, and, and I say that, like, I have so much respect for teachers and sometimes we create our own environments that are really hard to walk into. Like I, I had to sub one time, actually many times, but one time in particular, when I was subbing, I, went into a classroom that was a little bit disorganized, a lot bit disorganized, and there were not really clear plans for me to follow. And quickly things got out of control. And I I think I'm a person who has a pretty good grasp on classroom management and managing students, even when there's not a clear plan or even when it's a little bit tricky. And I could not get this together. And suddenly I have a second grader who is throwing Chromebooks at kids and a fight on the carpet between two children. And I literally had to break it up and hold a student by the shirt while evacuating the classroom. Right. Like that's, that's one thing, but I, that wasn't it. The thing that was hard for me was leaving there that day and knowing that they were coming back to the same thing the next day because nothing was going to change. Right. The kid who was throwing the computers and getting in a fight, it wasn't going to be different. There wasn't a magic fix. He wasn't going to come back and suddenly not do those things the next day. Um, The teachers who are crying and leaving the profession, um, everybody is feeling so overwhelmed that there's not moments of joy and connection. And that, that to me is the traumatic piece. Like how do we all keep coming back? When it is that hard every day. Very well said. And it is, we're all coexisting in that trauma, aren't we? Yep. Um, I think that one of the things that comes to my mind when you say this too, is that I, I asked earlier a bit flippantly, what's the solution? 
knowing that we don't have the solution. If we did, somebody would be doing it. But I think that the deeper level of that is, is that it can't just be a solution within the education system. Mm-hmm. It We're all going to have to get on board with this. Um, and that's that's what makes it so challenging, is that it's got to be a full societal effort. Yeah. And I don't think we can afford to wait for everybody to agree. Yeah. Right. Like we know the right thing to do. And even though it's scary and even though there's going to be pushback, we need to start doing it and show that this is what needs to happen. Yeah. Well, and I think you had mentioned in your survey that sometimes those loud voices that of the few are driving yeah. the majority of what we do. And this yes. essentially is bullying, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think we as a profession have to stand up to the bully. Right. And if the uh, bully doesn't like it, they can figure out their own education system, which they threaten to do most of the time anyway. They threaten to do and they do. And that's the thing, right? Like as a public education system, we need to work for everyone not for the loudest voices. And the the voices that need us the most are the ones who don't or can't speak up. Yeah. Yep. Okay, now I really am going to lighten things up. I promise. Okay. Okay. To balance out that whole mess. <laughs> we do think kids are funny. I know you think they're funny. I know I do too, because we've talked about this. Um, what's one of the funniest things you've experienced in your time as an educator? Okay. This was so early on. So like I said, at the beginning, I thought I was just going to be a special education teacher and that's where I'd spend all of my time. And the first time I was put into a classroom for a practicum. So I had been in a teaching program for two months or something and had no experience in a full classroom full of tiny humans. And they were like, you're in kindergarten, which if you work in education, you know, that's like maybe the scariest place to be. Yes, it is. And I remember immediately being like, what? I will take a classroom full of 12 kids who might punch me in the face any day over this classroom of 25, five and six year olds. Like this is the scariest thing I've ever done. And then immediately they're like, now you're going to teach a lesson. I'm like, wait, what? You want me to manage all of these kids at once, get them to all do something at the same time? Like, I I obviously cannot do this. I am doing the wrong thing. This is terrible. Um, but I did pull together a lesson. It's a lesson I've used many times over since. And um, if you are in education, you probably know this book. It's called, um, is it the most important thing? Anyway. I think so. Yeah. So uh, I haven't taught it in a few years, so forgive me for that. But yeah, the most important thing, and it talks about like the most important thing about an apple is that it's red. And then it goes on to describe like other things about it, like it's juicy and crunchy and whatever, but the most important thing is it's red. So we, and it talks about lots and lots of things like that. And then um, I I'm leading this group of kindergartners after reading this book with them, like what's important to you? What are some things that are important to you? And mind you, I have no experience in what kids are going to say, especially at this age. And they're sharing and they're like, you know, my dog's important to me, or it's important that we, you know, have dinner together and like very great answers from little kids. And then all of a sudden one of them's like, it's important for me to be naked. And I was like, wait, what? I don't, I don't know what to say about this. And, uh, (laughs) But you can't miss a beat, especially with kids at that age. And so I I remember quickly having to come up with something to redirect this conversation. And um, my my practicum teacher is just kind of looking at me like, yeah, what are you going to do? Right. Didn't <laughs> offer me anything. And I'm just like, I, I know I came to it quickly, but it felt like it took an hour. And finally, I was like. Yeah, it's so important to have privacy at home. Like and, nice and we, save. Right? And and that was it. But I have never stopped laughing at that. Like, of course, of course. The first lesson I ever teach in the scariest environment I've ever been in, this kid's like, 
telling everybody about being naked at home. Ooh. And you know, all of us are having classroom meetings now at all levels. And you uh -huh. got to be careful with those because you ask one, it does not seem like a loaded question. And every once in a while you'll get, you know, my dad drinks beer till he falls asleep on the couch every night and my mom hates it. And you're just like, whoo, yes, the couch yes. is a great place to sleep. Sometimes I fall asleep on the couch, you know, and then of course you have another kid. Oh, do you drink beer every night too? So they're great. <laughs> Kids are yeah. great. Very honest. <laughs> The most okay. honest. Yes. So I have a bonus question for you. Hopefully okay. you haven't. Been, I mean, I want you to listen to the podcast, but hopefully you haven't been so you won't know what I'm going to ask. But you go into the staff room. The sink is full of dirty dishes, but you need to get a glass of water. What do you do? Oh, see, that's not a fair question because it really depends, right? Do I have time to do those dishes? Maybe, maybe, I mean, I'm going to be honest in my own experience. I work with the kids that everybody has nothing nice to say about. So I don't use the staff room, which makes me personally not want to do those dishes. Uh-huh. I get that. Uh-huh. So whose job is it to do the dishes? I, I know we all hate it. But the sign up, I think, is the only right way. Like, we have to figure out how to be in community together. And that is one of the ways. And this is totally a tangent from your question. But I remember also trying to advocate that we just don't talk about students in the staff room. And the pushback I got from that was wild. I also so like, I want, to, I, I want to be able to use this space. And I won't if you all keep saying the things you say. And yes. well, um, yeah, that's that's a good tangent to go on, though, because if you'll recall, I also went on a tangent, but mine was I'm not cleaning your damn dirty dishes. Uh -huh. I will clean the microwave, the microwave. once a that. month, but yeah. I'm not coming in here and cleaning up after you pigs. And you know what? They took me up on it. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. we had the clean. We had a clean microwave all school year. Just we saying. did. And I appreciated that because that is the only thing I would go in there to do. I would get my lunch out of the refrigerator. If I needed to, I would heat it up and then I would leave. It was a rare occurrence that I would sit in there and I certainly wasn't using the dishes. And I mean, the sign up is one thing, but also how hard is it to put your own dish in the dishwasher? I agree. That is actually what the sign up sheet should be, right? Who's going to empty the dishwasher? That's it. That's the that's only job. That's all the sign up. Okay. Oh. That, that's that's it. And and if that's the case, you should sign up if you use it because some of us just opt out. That's right. That's right. And there should be enough of you because there's always dirty dishes in that damn sink. Uh -huh. So there's enough of you to do your sign up list to empty the uh -huh. dishwasher. All right. Absolutely. That's how I feel. Yeah. I see you. I see you, Tracy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on my podcast. Is there anything else that you would like to say before we go? I just think it's incredible that you are creating this space for us to have these conversations because I don't think as we alluded to, or didn't even allude to, but clearly stated, most people don't know what's happening really truly in the world of education. So Glad you're doing this, and I hope this can be part of the conversation about what needs to happen to make Me things too. different. I wish I knew. Today's episode was produced and edited by me. The theme music is by Otis McDonald featuring Joni Inez. If you know someone who might enjoy these conversations, please share the podcast episodes as much and as often as you can. It's as simple as copying the link you use to access today's episode and sending it in a message or sharing it on social media. I'm a small, independent operation, and your shares broaden our audience. Perhaps you or someone you know will be inspired to talk about teacher burnout. If you would like to get your voice on my podcast, contact me via the link on my webpage, tot.buzzsprout.com. Coach, speaker, and author Rashid Ogunlaru said, 
It may take many voices for people to hear the same message. Join me in being one of the many voices rising up to get the message out around educator burnout. This is Melissa LaFour. Thank you for listening to Taught the Podcast. I wish I knew.